when two planes collide in Brazilian airspace. The results are catastrophic. It was clear to all of us that we were about to die. It acted like a knife and basically cut off a significant piece of that wing, disabling the aircraft. With the sky so tightly controlled, how could this happen? When I first heard about the gold mid-air collision, it didn't make sense to me. Two professional pilots, how do you end up at the same altitude? Lessons that should have been learned a decade earlier. Everything was charred. There was no question of any recognition. That memory will never leave me. It's, it's horrifying. It was a tragedy beyond words and in the skies over Japan. And they are now either going to explode and die or they're going to get under it. Those are the only two options. There's nothing else left. Failed to save Gulf Flight 1907, and the reason leaves investigators dumbfounded. Com certeza, esse foi um dos cenários mais complexos que eu já tinha encontrado. September 29th, 2006. São José dos Campos Airport, Brazil. The new owners of the Embraer Legacy 600, a $25 million business jet, offer New York Times journalist Joe Sharkey a lift back to the US. I said, well, that's a great idea. That, that would make you know a really interesting column. And so we set off in this luxurious business jet The jet will fly across the sweeping Amazon rainforest, refueling in Manaus on its way to the US. From his seat overlooking the wing, Joe has a perfect view of the landscape below. It's a sunny day, it was late afternoon. Uh, the visibility was endless. I would remember being astonished at how vast the Amazon forest was. Flying the jet are two American pilots, Captain Joe Lepore and co-pilot Jan Palladino. Between them, they have 30 years of flying experience. With clear skies, the flying conditions are perfect. 600 X-ray Lima. November 600 X-ray Lima. Squawk item weather surveillance. Accompanying Sharky on the journey are four other passengers. After the initial excitement, they settle down and relax into the flight. The flight was four hours diagonally across the Amazon. And all of us, we were sort of tired. Everybody sort of drifted into their own business. I was looking forward to arriving back in New York. As the Embraer sails over the rainforest at 37,000 feet, they have no idea another flight is heading directly toward them. Gol Transportes Aereos Flight 1907, a Boeing 737, carrying 154 passengers, took off from Manaus just an hour earlier and is now also cruising at 37,000 feet on its way to Rio de Janeiro. The pilot in command of Flight 1907 is the experienced Captain Decio Chavez Jr., a Boeing 737 instructor with over 13,000 flight hours. Beside him is the 29-year-old co-pilot, Tiago Jodao Crusoe, who already has over 3,000 flight hours, most of them in a 737. But their combined experience can't prepare them for a head-on collision. Two aeronaves voando in in altitude, no caso, ambos estavam a 37,000 pés. Num dia de sol claro, é quase impossível se visualizar uma aeronave que esteja vindo na sua direção, mesmo com o céu claro. With both aircraft traveling at 500 miles per hour, the combined closing speed leaves no time to react. Basically, it's, it's 1,000 miles an hour. When the airplanes are at closure rates, 
that's this high, you really don't have very long. Even through clear skies, neither crew see what's coming. I think everybody on the plane was sort of dozing at this point, and suddenly the loudest noise I've ever heard in my life. What the hell was that? As the Embraer flies just feet beneath the Boeing, its left winglet collides with the larger plane's left wing, slicing clean through it. I was surprised that the amount of damage that the winglet of the Embraer did to the Boeing, because that's a very tough, well-built airplane. It seems inconceivable that the smaller plane could cause so much damage. But it was just the angle in which the winglet hit the actual wing of the 737 that, in fact, uh, it, it acted like a knife and basically cut off a significant piece of that wing, basically disabling the aircraft. With the loss of its wing, the Boeing is sent into a nosedive. It plummets to the earth in an uncontrollable spin. Mas era impossível para qualquer piloto manter qualquer condição de de voo. The extreme forces tear the plane apart before crashing into the forest below, scattering wreckage and passengers across the dense jungle. In response to mounting public anger at the horror of this catastrophe, the Brazilian authorities are under pressure to provide answers. Troops struggle to reach the remote crash site. They are airdropped into the jungle and work with locals to hack through the impenetrable forest. When they find the wreckage, it is immediately clear there are no survivors. Lead investigator, Colonel Rufino Ferreira arrives on the scene within hours. Na realidade, eles, os destroços se espalharam por uma área de aproximadamente 5 mil metros quadrados. Era uma área de mata muito fechada. Com certeza, esse foi um dos cenários mais complexos que eu já tinha encontrado. Eu nunca tinha trabalhado com, com destroços tão espalhados e numa área tão de difícil acesso. Rufino's team of investigators inspect the crash site to piece together evidence. Their first priority is to recover the Boeing's data recorders. A nossa, o nosso desafio era saber por que que aquilo aconteceu. Meteorologia muito boa. Há pouca possibilidade de acontecer um acidente nessas condições. Rufino strongly suspects that the American pilots were at fault. E na realidade, o nosso desafio era descobrir por que, que as duas aeronaves se encontraram na, na mesma rota e no mesmo nível. When I first heard about the Gold Mid Air collision, it didn't make sense to me. Two professional pilots, how do you end up at the same altitude? Is it possible that the highly experienced American pilots could make such a fatal mistake? It had happened before. A decade earlier, two airplanes collided after catastrophic pilot error. 6.20 p.m., 12th of November, 1996. Saudi Arabian Airlines flight SVA-763 is preparing to leave Delhi, India, for Saudi Arabia, carrying 312 passengers and crew. The Saudi Boeing 747, it had more than 300 passengers on board. They were family members, there were, uh, there were, were women, there were, there were children. 6.32 p.m. The cleared for takeoff. The Boeing 747 is cleared for takeoff. At the same time, a Kazakhstan Airlines flight has been cleared to land at Delhi with 27 passengers and 10 crew on board. This converted military cargo jet is being flown by a highly experienced pilot, Gennady Cherepanov, who has 9,200 flight hours under his belt. In the cockpit with him are his co-pilot, and in the jump seat behind them is radio operator Igor Rep. Both flights are under the guidance of the same air traffic controller, 
VK Dutta. Dutta clears the Kazakhstan plain to descend to 15,000 feet. Roger, maintain 15,000 feet. On the flight deck, Igor Reb translates the instruction from English to Russian for the pilot. Nine kilometers. Meanwhile, the Saudi plane, which is traveling in the opposite direction, is instructed to climb to 14,000 feet. Saudi 760, climb to 14,000 feet. This standard procedure means that although both planes will be crossing over the same point, they will be separated by a minimum of 1,000 feet. Data alerts both crews that they will be passing each other. Zero 07, identity traffic 12 o'clock, reciprocal. Saudi Boeing 747, traffic is at 8 mile, level 140. The controller is advising the pilots to be on the lookout that this aircraft is out there and what their intentions are going to be. Usually the instruction would be, hey, uh, traffic is 12 o'clock, they're going to level 1,000 feet below you. It gives the pilots an opportunity to not be surprised when they see an airplane out there and we're look. But they aren't the only planes in Dutta's section. Also on the approach into Delhi, and following directly behind the Kazakh plane, is a US Air Force cargo flight. On the flight deck is Captain Tim Place. The air was smooth, it was clear, it was a beautiful night. You could see the lights of the city. It was just, you know, it was dusk. Beautiful conditions to be flying in. Tim has no idea he is about to witness something horrific. The Kazakh plane doesn't have a thousand feet clearance as it approaches the Saudi flight. Roger, maintain flight level. Something has gone catastrophically wrong. Dutta expects the two planes to pass harmlessly over each other. He has no idea that they are actually on a collision course. Saudi 760, do you receive? Kazakh 1907, do you receive? On the US cargo flight, Tim witnesses something he will never forget. This cloud lit up and got brighter and brighter. We just saw a couple of objects that were kind of like corkscrewing, trailing fire. And the first thing I said was, that, are those missiles? Because they looked like they were, they were coming right at us and we actually started an evasive maneuver. Uh, the pilot command started banking away. What neither Tim nor Dutta realize is that they have both witnessed their worst nightmare. The tail of the Kazakh plane slices through the wing of the Saudi airliner. The Saudi plane cannot survive the impact and breaks apart in mid-air. The Kazakh plane falls into an uncontrolled descent before hitting the ground with such force that all 37 people on board die instantly. Report your position. When the controller sees the radar targets disappear and simultaneously cannot establish contact communications with the flight crew. Kazakh 1907, do you receive? It's a very sinking feeling for that controller. Obviously, no, something has gone horribly wrong. Realizing that it's a mid-air collision, that was a very sobering moment and feeling quite vulnerable at the same time. Saudi 760, do you receive? Kazakh 1907, report your position. As Dutta's calls go unanswered, Tim radios air traffic control to confirm the terrible truth. This is 1815. Go ahead, 1815. I've just seen something that looks like an explosion. We talked to the controller, and the controller queries the 
airplanes with no response, dead silence. And I'm sure at the point at that point he's questioning himself. Any any human being would, um, and he knows that it was a 747 and uh, you know 250 plus souls on board. was in the evening, a little after 7 p.m. or so, when I was told by my editor of a plane crash which has taken place, we sort of sped away in the direction of a place which we'd never heard about before, Charki Dadri. As Vishnu approaches the crash site, the true scale of the devastation reveals itself. It was sad beyond words. I saw parts of bodies, I saw dead bodies, I saw a small tree um, and, and, and parts of bodies and limbs hanging from it. Captain KPS Nair, an aviation expert with over 45 years experience, was charged with leading the investigation. I reached the site early morning, around 5 a.m. It was disastrous. The wreckage was spread seven to eight kilometers. Everything was charred. There was no question of any recognition. The site itself was such a distasteful thing that I can't forget in my life. Human flesh burned smell. And the site itself was so horrible, I could not properly sleep or eat. It just seems like it happened yesterday because that memory will never leave me. It's, it's horrifying. It was a tragedy beyond words. Over 350 people have died, making this the world's deadliest mid-air collision. The team picked their way through the carnage to piece together what went wrong. One team went around looking for evidences as to what could have caused the accident itself. Then. Another group started working to locate the black boxes. One black box contains flight data. The other records conversations between pilots in the cockpit. They are crucial to understanding the events leading up to the crash. Meanwhile, Nair begins interviewing air traffic control, and in particular, the flight controller, VK Dutta. As the person responsible for maintaining separation between aircraft, it was inevitable that Tutter would be in the firing line. Initially, there was a public presumption that it could be because of an air traffic control human error that led to the accident. Dutta relives the moments before the crash. He is adamant that he had given the pilots of both planes the correct instructions. With both pilots now dead, only the black boxes can prove whether he's telling the truth. And investigators now have that evidence in their possession. Nair can now listen directly to Dutta's instructions. Had he followed correct procedure, or was he responsible for the deaths of hundreds of people? climb to 14,000 feet. The evidence preserved in the cockpit recordings prove that Dutta did indeed give the pilots the correct instructions. Going through the air traffic control tape or recorder, we found that there was no deviation or error on the part of the air traffic controller. So it was not an ATC error at all. But the tapes throw up another mystery. The pilots of both planes confirm that they are at those safe altitudes. So how could they have crashed? To find out, Nair turns to the second black box containing the flight data. He soon discovers that the Kazakhstani pilots weren't at the altitude they thought they were at. They were 1,000 feet lower, 
heading directly towards the Saudi plane. This startling revelation places the Kazakh pilots squarely in the frame. Naye must now find out why two highly competent Kazakh pilots would divert from air traffic control instructions. He returns to the cockpit voice recorders for insights. Nair realizes that the Kazakh radio operator, Igor Rep, was translating English instructions from air traffic control into Russian. We're dealing with flight crews of two aircraft and controllers that are not speaking their native language. They're all speaking in aviation English. An aircraft descending takes 15 seconds only to pass through 1,000 feet. And while translating and communicating into a different language, person to person, the human error factor comes in. That was one of the important causes of the accident. Saudi 760 climbed to 14,000 feet. But this wasn't the only fatal mistake. At the same time, the Kazakh co-pilot was converting altitude readings from kilometers into feet. The Aleutian airplane might very well have been equipped with metric reading instruments, and the conversion to feet very well could have been misapplied. Nae's investigation concludes that the pilot's calculations were faulty. They had mistakenly believed that they were at the correct altitude. The simple error was compounded by the crew's poor grasp of English. At the time, Indian air traffic control had no means of confirming the altitude of the planes. They had to rely purely on the readings reported from the cockpit. In 1996, uh, the Indian air traffic control system did not have the technology to positively identify uh, the aircraft's altitude. The only way that the uh, air traffic controllers knew the altitude of the aircraft was verbal confirmation from the pilot. So that complicates matters quite a bit. Nae's report recommends compulsory fail-safes to prevent pilot error, including technology that gives air traffic control up-to-date readings of an aircraft's actual altitude. Now, secondary radar automatically transmits a plane's position and identity to air traffic control, so they no longer have to rely on pilots to track planes in their region. Even if the pilots are unaware that they have changed altitude, air traffic control can correct them. Key recommendations that came out of this event are the installation of secondary radar. The air traffic service facilities in India was upgraded. Secondary surveillance radar was introduced in number of airports. I'm proud that we have been able to achieve that. As a result of the Chakri Dadri mid-air collision, Secondary radar was rolled out internationally, including in Brazil. So why hadn't this technology prevented the Boeing 737's collision with the Embraer? With the Brazilian media desperate for answers, lead investigator Colonel Rufino Ferreira is trying to understand how, given secondary radar, a Boeing 737 could have collided mid-air with an Embraer private jet. A investigação começa de imediato. A investigação é uma tarefa muito grande. E a primeira coisa, como toda investigação, é coletar dados. As always, the black boxes were key to knowing whether one of the pilots made a mistake. Todos os dados gravados, toda a tecnologia é, nos permitiu reconstituir completamente como é, as autorizações foram sendo passadas e como as aeronaves acabaram se posicionando na, no mesmo nível, na mesma rota. Rufino scrutinizes the Boeing's altitude just moments before the collision, comparing it to their cleared flight plan. He finds that they were flying at 37,000 feet, exactly the altitude they were cleared for. The Boeing pilots are cleared of any responsibility. 
não houve nenhuma ação incorreta ou algum descumprimento de instrução, porque talvez tenha sido uma, uma fatalidade, uma infelicidade. Immediately, suspicion swings towards Paladino and Lepore flying the Embraer. And in this case, Rufino had more than the black boxes to rely on. Miraculously, the seven people aboard the Embraer lived to tell the tale. New York Times journalist Joe Sharkey recalls sailing over the Amazon rainforest in the $25 million business jet. Everything was very quiet and very sedate until kaboom, the world changed. What the hell was that? Sharkey sees a jagged ridge at the end of the wing where the five foot tall winglet is supposed to be. And I raised my window shade and looked out and I saw that a chunk of the left wing had, had looked at it as if it had been bitten off. Though they have no idea how the winglet was destroyed, they do know it's serious and the situation is rapidly getting worse. Rivets are lifting from the leading edge of the wing and it's starting to peel back. We're losing altitude and, and I asked one of the Embraer guys, I said, this, this is not good, is it? I said, no, this is not good. With the loss of the winglet, the plane's aerodynamics are fatally compromised. In the cockpit, the pilots struggle to keep the plane level. Let me fly. The more experienced co-pilot, Paladino, seizes control. He wrestles to keep the plane stable, while Lepore radios out a mayday. November 600, X-ray Lima. More and more the trees, which had been a vast forest, were coming. I was starting to see the, the uh, individual trees, and I thought, oh boy, we're in a bit of a, a, a jam here. Below them is mile upon mile of jungle. No plane can survive a crash landing in the dense canopy without being ripped apart. Auxilia radio. I think it was clear to all of us that we were about to die. Jesus, Joe, we're gonna have to land this. As the pilots struggle to keep control of the Embraer, Sharky's hopes of survival fade. Your life passes before you, is, is the cliche, and it does. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna write a uh, note to my wife, which I scribbled on my notebook, and tore the page out. And I stuck it in my wallet, thinking, well, they may find the wallet, at least there'll be that. And I thought, well, this is how I go. And I, I really, my main emotion was disappointment. Like, I really do have things to do. We need to find a place to land. In the cockpit, the pilots search frantically for a landing strip whilst wrestling to keep the plane level. But in this remote region, the pilots can't make contact with air traffic control for help. Miraculously, they receive a lifeline when a nearby plane picks up their distress call and directs them towards a nearby military airfield. With the Embraer rapidly losing altitude, can they make it in time? I heard one of the pilots say, I see an airport. Okay, guys, we found a landing strip. And I could see, okay, a little clear, a little gash in the, in, in the expanse of jungle. With the airstrip in sight, the pilots prepare to land. But they find that the damaged wing flaps can't extend to slow their descent. Coming in fast means they risk crashing at the end of the runway. They were keeping the plane steady. And I thought, well, these guys are going to probably bring this in, but if not, it's going to be a spectacular crash. Incredibly, they have survived. We were happy. We were delighted. You know, we thought, well, okay, we we got a we got a second chance on life. But their celebrations are soon cut short. As we got off, there were uh, maybe a dozen Brazilian army guys with rifles, and they had the rifles pointed at us. And I thought. Okay, here's where you don't want to make a false move. At this point, we didn't know what had happened. We didn't know that we had collided with another airplane. The seven people aboard the Embraer have no idea that they have just survived a mid-air collision and are being blamed for the deaths of 154 people. 
The Brazilian media has no doubts. As mounting public anger pressures the authorities into criminalizing the Embraer pilots. The Brazilians at that time uh, looked at this as a crime and treated the pilots as criminals. I mean, it was a big, it was an international incident of uh, huge dimensions. All 154 people aboard the Boeing 737 perished when it broke up mid-air and crashed to the jungle floor. Colonel Rufino Ferreira is under pressure to find out whether the American pilots are to blame. Things look bad for Lepore and Palladino when Joe Sharkey confirms that the private jet was flying at the wrong altitude. The ride was very smooth, no turbulence. I casually wandered up because the pilots had invited several of us up to just, you know, have a look out the cockpit window. I do remember talking to them, it was very casual, you know, it's fun to go into a cockpit and look from the front of the plane. But I do remember looking at the altimeter and seeing that it was 37,000 feet. The cockpit voice recorders confirm Sharkey's testimony. Rafina must now determine why the two American pilots amended their planned altitude. He brings in a team to interrogate the pilots. Então existem psicólogos que vão cuidar, entrevistar médicos, ver toda a parte ligada à fisiologia, à psicologia de todas as pessoas envolvidas, controladores. Why were you flying at 37,000 feet? Their response staggers him. Because we were told. Who told you? Ground control and ADC cleared us to 37,000. They wouldn't say that! The American pilots insist they were following air traffic control instructions. In discussing it with the pilots, there wasn't a matter of blame, it was just a matter of fact, saying we were issued this clearance and we complied with it. And it, that, that's, that's as far as the discussion went. If they are lying, the evidence will be captured on the cockpit voice recorder. To Rufino's surprise, the tape confirms the pilots were telling the truth. Rufino hears air traffic control clearing the Embraer to cruise at 37,000 feet. At no point did they rectify this mistake. Air traffic control had set the private jet on a collision course. The pilots were cleared to 37,000 feet as air traffic control clearance. At no time did the controllers ever amend that altitude and issue a new clearance in the form of 36,000 feet. So the pilots did absolutely the right thing by maintaining their clearance altitude of 37,000 feet. Rufino turns the focus of the investigation onto air traffic control. He knows that it is common for air traffic control to amend the altitude based on traffic and weather conditions. But why would they put two planes on the same altitude at the same time? The whole premise of the air traffic control system is to prevent collisions. It is a controller's highest priority to maintain separation of the aircraft within their sector. It is absolutely a priority to not only know the aircraft in your sector, but know what they're predicted to do, as well as what they're actually doing. Air traffic control tells Rufino they had intended to correct the altitude, but forgot. After the Delhi disaster, they had been equipped with secondary radar. So why didn't they heed the warnings? As the investigation unfolded and it became clear that the instructions from air traffic control is what created the conflict, the question, underlying question then is the effectiveness of that air traffic control system. Their answer is staggering. The controllers simply didn't notice the alarm. A seasoned controller used to doing this every day, seeing these data blocks several times a day, uh, should be very aware of what that information is telling him. There should not be any surprises on that data block. Uh, so this is something that should have been uh, noted uh, by the controllers, uh, pretty obvious. The most surprising thing to me was the obvious thing, that air traffic controllers, that they would carelessly have put two airplanes on the same path, you know, on, on a collision course, 
in airspace in which there were only three planes flying over the Amazon, the central Amazon at that time. But despite the confession, Rufino remains baffled. The accident should still have been prevented. There was another piece of technology that should have alerted the pilots to the impending disaster. Technology that proved its worth just five years earlier, this time in Japan. 31st of January, 2001, Haneda, 3.50 p.m. Japan Airlines Flight 907, a Boeing 747, is carrying 427 passengers en route to Naha Airport in Okinawa. The flight attendants have just started to serve drinks. In the cockpit are Captain Makoto Watanabe and his co-pilot, Tatsuyuki Akazawa. The air traffic controller, Hideki Hachitani, clears the Boeing 747 to climb to 39,000 feet, and they start their ascent. But Hachitani is only a trainee, handling 10 other flights at the time, and he has inadvertently steered them dangerously close to another plane. Cruising at 37,000 feet is JAL Flight 958, the DC-10 is carrying 250 people from Kimhae Airport in South Korea to Narita International Airport in Japan. Climb to flight level 390. Hachitani doesn't realize that he has set this DC-10 on a direct collision course with the 747. Disaster seems inevitable. But both planes carry a piece of technology designed to trigger automatically in precisely this situation. It's called Traffic Collision Avoidance System, or TCAS. TCAS automatically detects when two planes are on a collision course and simultaneously gives both pilots instructions on how to avoid it. The Traffic Collision and Avoidance System, known as TCAS, is a absolutely wonderful technology that has reduced mid-airs to being mid-air collisions to being almost non-existent. The TCAS alarm inside the DC-10 instructs the pilots to descend. The pilots follow the instructions. The TCAS alarm inside the cockpit of the Boeing 747 simultaneously instructs these pilots to climb. The system has done its job and set the two planes on different altitudes. But in air traffic control, the rookie Hachitani receives a separate alarm. Unaware that TCAS has already averted the danger, Hachitani starts to panic. There was a flashing light of a conflict and it estimated 56 seconds until the two aircraft came together, so there was not a lot of time to react. The trainee tells the Boeing to descend. Xiao 907, descend to flight level 350. Directly contradicting the instructions they had just received from TCAS. Which instruction do they follow? The pilot chooses to disregard the TCAS instruction to climb line, line. and instead follows Hachitani's order to descend. Descend, descend. The two planes are once again flying straight towards each other. Boeing is following air traffic control instructions to descend, and the DC-10 is following TCAS instructions to descend. Now they're both descending towards each other on a collision course. With time running out, supervisor Yusuko Momi spots the trainee's error and overrides his order, telling the plane to climb. But in the confusion, she uses the wrong name, calling orders to JAL 957. The Boeing is flight 907. 
The DC-10 is flight 958. Somehow, she has combined those numbers in her head, and she's now making an instruction to 957, which makes no sense to anyone. That aircraft is not in her airspace. So, 957. When controllers misidentify numbers on the data block, that is an indication of a high-stress, high-anxiety situation. And in a situation like this, things are happening very rapidly. These aircraft are closing at nearly 1,000 miles per hour. It really amps up the anxiety. The captain and the first officer must have been horrified that they're still on a converging course. They can see the DC-10 getting bigger and bigger in their windscreen. At air traffic control, the trainee and his supervisor watch helplessly as the two planes converge on their radar screen. And they are now either going to explode and die or they're going to get under it. Those are the only two options. There's nothing else left. At the very last moment, the Boeing pilot instinctively forces his aircraft into an emergency descent. A few seconds later, the two dots separate, and there's still two dots in the display. And that's got to be an incredible moment where you are hoping against hope. Are these planes OK? With the planes racing towards each other at 1,000 miles per hour, the DC-10 and 747 had avoided certain deaths by just 135 meters. In the Boeing cabin, unbelted passengers are thrown out of their seats. Some cubocast to Kino Eki no Naka no Jo Taiwa, so they are most Suzamaji Jo Tai de. It's absolute chaos back there, and almost everybody suffers at least some injury of some type. But both planes have survived. Though seven passengers and two crew on the Boeing have sustained serious injuries, there have been no fatalities. With 677 passengers on board those two aircraft and a collision at 37,000 feet, no one could possibly have survived. That disaster would have been the worst aviation disaster that we have ever known. Despite the litany of human errors, disaster over Japan was narrowly averted. With every investigation and with every incident, we are learning more about how people and technology work together and what we need to do to keep our skies safe. JTSB investigator Yukiko Kakimoto concludes that despite the contradictory instructions, pilots should always follow TCAS. The failure to do so had put the lives of over 600 people in peril. These findings lead Yukiko to recommend new guidelines to ensure if a TCAS alarm sounds, pilots follow it, even when TCAS contradicts instructions from air traffic control. One of the takeaways from this uh, incident was the strict adherence by pilots to the TCAS command even if it overrides uh, the controller. Human instinct saved these planes, but it was the TCAS that put both pilots on high alert. Why hadn't this also happened in the skies over Brazil? Brazilian investigators are desperate to know why TCAS didn't prevent the deadly collision that killed 154 people. One of my very early questions about this accident was, where was TCAS? Because both of these airplanes are equipped with it by regulation. And so, uh, how did this mid-air occur? By studying the cockpit voice recorders from both planes, 
Colonel Rufino Ferreira discovers that the TCAS didn't issue any alerts. Before the collision, there was absolutely no indication that anything was amiss. Uh, there was no alarm that I heard in the cockpit, and the cockpit door, as I said, was open. Without TCAS on the Embraer, not only could it not see the Boeing, but the Boeing couldn't see the Embraer. Both planes were effectively invisible and blind. How did the warning system get disabled? There was speculation that potentially uh, one of the pilots making a change may have accidentally turned it off. There may well have been an anomaly. We just don't know. The only thing we did know is that it wasn't on and that the pilots didn't realize it wasn't on. The Embraer's pilots, Joe Lepore and Jan Palladino, denied turning off the TCAS. Rufino needed to know precisely when the error occurred. With remarkable detective work, Rufino was able to identify the exact moment the TCAS was turned off. Graças a os dados da cabine do Legas, somados aos dados de voo do Legas, somados comparados aos dados extraídos do controle de tráfego aéreo, nós podemos verificar exatamente o momento em que ele parou de transmitir. The TCAS had been disabled an hour before the collision. The pilots had flown all that time without noticing that TCAS had been turned off. These were very subtle alarms that, in fact, were given a tiny little readout that, unless you were studying and looking very closely at it, you, you probably would have missed it. And frankly, these pilots did. They had no clue that their TCAS and their transponder was off. The fact is that the alarms that were disponible in the aeronave were not sufficient to call the attention of the pilots. A tiny line of text on the dashboard was the only warning the pilots had. No alarms had sounded. A compounding of human errors meant that none of the technological fail-safes had worked. Both pilots were charged with negligence for not realizing TCAS was off. Então, na realidade, uh, uh, foi uma sucessão de falhas é, na maior parte delas, falhas é, ligadas à, à percepção humana, tanto da parte dos pilotos como da parte dos controladores. The human errors made by the Brazilian controllers raises serious questions about the safety of the country's air traffic control system. Brazil's aviation industry is subsequently thrown into crisis with massive flight delays, cancellations and protests. As a result, Brazil is forced to improve its air traffic control system. O controle de tráfego aéreo mudou muita coisa na formação dos, dos controladores, no software. O controle de tráfego aéreo realmente reviu praticamente todos os seus procedimentos no intuito de melhorar a condição de percepção. And to prevent the plane's TCAS being switched off without pilots realizing, design changes are recommended to clearly alert pilots if the system is switched off. The recommendation was to provide an alarm, a more robust sound or a signal to the flight crew to let them know that their TCAS isn't on it. This recommendation becomes regulation. With their traffic continually to increase, we're putting more and more passengers in the sky, more and more aircraft in the sky. So there always will be a risk of inter collisions. It's how we manage that risk. Each accident investigation leads to improvements that make flying safer by the day. Although the American pilots were convicted by a Brazilian court for criminal negligence, their prison sentences were commuted to be spent as community service in the United States. I'm constantly aware that there are 154 people who died, and I didn't. I still think of it every day. I'm utterly aware of how lucky we seven were. The hope is that the tragic deaths of over 500 people caused by mid-air collisions above India and Brazil will never happen again.